All right, we are live on Facebook. Facebook, welcome. Glad you are here with us. This is Mike Davis, live from the Oasis. So glad that you are here. We're going to get into our study after we pray. So let's pray and just ask for God's leadership, guidance, and blessing. Father, we look to you. We thank you for opening our eyes, for showing us your ways, for teaching us your paths, for leading and guiding us into your truth and teaching us because you are the God of our salvation and upon you we wait all the day. So we thank you, Lord, for your leadership and your guidance in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we are on now lesson number 34, <laughs> talking about who's the boss, women and men in biblical and cultural context. So uh, last week, we began talking about rethinking the complementarian foundation for women's subordination, rethinking the complementarian foundation for women's subordination. And by the way, if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Kings chapter 4, and we're going to be looking at verse 8 in just a moment. Just kind of want to catch up to where we were from last week. So again, we start, uh, in, in all the studies that we've been doing, we've been, I, I came to the point and I said, you know, well, we need to start to rethink with what we found so far, what, what, what we have looked at so far. We need to start rethinking the complementarian foundation that they utilize for women's subordination, that women are to submit to men. That foundation is based upon what I call the patriarchal principle. And the idea that behind that is that men are created uh, by God to be the leader and they are to lead women. Women are created to submit to and follow the lead of the man and women are to never lead men. And what I've said that as we've looked into the biblical text and in the Old Testament, in the Torah, in the Tanakh, we do not really see women acting or living according to this principle as it is articulated from a complementarian point of view. In other words, we just don't see women as like, well, I got to submit to my husband. I got to check with my husband and I'm looking for my husband to lead me and guide me and direct me as to what I'm to do and how I'm supposed to do it. When you look into the, 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 the Torah, into the Tanakh, you really don't see this. Rather, what we see are women acting with authority and with autonomy. They are self-governing. They are acting on their own. They are making decisions. We see this, as we said last week, in Deborah, uh, the, the prophet and judge of Israel. We see this in the wise woman of Abel, Bet Ma'acha. We see this, in, we saw this in Abigail, the wife of Nabal, who later became, also she became the wife of David. In each of these stories, we see these women not being led by their husbands or men, or by men in general. What We, we see these women leading men, actually. We see them making decisions independent of their husbands, even sometimes contrary to the decisions of their husband, as we saw with Abigail. We see them acting from their own authority, as we saw with, again, Deborah. Of course, she's acting from the authority that comes from God, but also the, the wise woman of Abel Bet Ma'acha, when there is the danger of a, of a war coming against her village, she makes a strategic decision that saves the village. She, and as we saw, she didn't check with the men first. She, she didn't consult with anyone. We're not told that. We know she talked with uh, Joab, who was the general coming against her, uh, uh, her city, getting ready to tear it down to capture one guy, destroy the city. And she talks with him, persuades him from doing that and says, what is it that you want? And they said, we want this guy, Sheba. She says, wait here, we'll throw his head over the wall. And that's, that, that decision she made, she went and boom, they threw his head over the wall. I mean, the men of the city, the leaders of the city, the other leaders, they listened to her, which suggests that this woman was, as they said, a wise woman. Her counsel was listening, listened to, her counsel was followed. So we see women not being just led, not really being led by men in these stories. We see women doing the leading. And again, this is what I call, it's, it's contrary to, it's contradictory to the, the patriarchal principle, this view within the complementarian theology that says, hey, women, uh, men are created to be the leaders. Women are created to submit to and follow that lead. They are to be led by men and women are to never lead men. And again, what I'm saying here is that we see stories that contradict this within the Old Testament scriptures, okay? So, um, we do not see women fulfilling or operating by the patriarchal principle. And we do not see men in these, by the way, we also do not see men in these stories opposing or rejecting the wisdom, the authority, and the leadership of the women because they are women. We don't see that happening. They're not rejecting the leadership. They're not rejecting the wisdom. They're not rejecting or questioning their authority. We see them following along with it. 
Okay. Now, um, in, this, in the case of Abigail, she makes a decision. The servants don't go against her. As we said last week, you can go back and watch that entire thing. All right. Another story that goes contrary, because I want to look at at least two more narratives within the biblical text. One is, uh, another one that goes contrary to the patriarchal principle is the story of the Shunammite, uh, the Shunammite woman in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8 through 10. So let's look at her. We're going to look at her story a little bit. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8 and 10. The prophet of this time period is Elijah. It says, now it happened one day that Elijah went to Shunam, where there was a notable woman, and she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was, as often as she passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. And she said to her husband, look, now, look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please let us make a small upper room on the wall. Let us put a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand. So it will be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. Okay, uh, and I'm gonna stop right there. So there's some interesting and some, uh, there's some interesting and notable features in the stories that as I was studying this, other scholars have brought out that I wanna bring out too. Number one is that the, it just refers to her as it, well, it says it happened one day he went to Shunem. The Shunemite woman is not given a name. We don't know what her name is. So she's not named. And as uh, Carol Meyer said uh, in her book, uh, Rediscovering Eve, which is this book here I've been quoting from, one of the books I've been quoting from, Carol Meyer, she's a scholar. She says, unlike virtually all other women in the biblical narrative, she is not presented as the wife of so-and-so. We don't know her husband's name. So her name is not given to us. And she is not really uh, connected to a husband as it normally is done within scripture when it says that she is the wife of so-and-so. It doesn't say the, the, the Shunanite woman is the wife of so-and-so. Doesn't name her husband at all. We're not ever given. We know she's married, but we're not given the, the name of her husband. Even with Deborah, uh, it says she, is, she was the wife of Lapidoth, and that's taking it if Lapidoth was the name of her husband, if it didn't mean something else. Um, and other women would be mentioned. You know, Abigail was the wife of Nabal. So throughout the biblical text, throughout the scriptures, we see often women's names are associated with their husband. This woman is not given a name, nor is she associated with her husband by name. In other words, her husband is not named. She is not called the wife of so-and-so, okay? So that's interesting. Also, uh, rather, well, I should say that rather than also, rather than giving her name or associating her name with her husband, she is referred to in verse, uh, uh, verse eight, She's referred to as a notable woman. She is a notable woman. It says that Elijah went to Shunem where there was a notable woman. Now, what's interesting about this, uh, this could also be translated, I got notable woman here in my New King James Version. This could also be translated as a great woman. She is a great woman. The term that's used, the term in Hebrew, gedola, is a word used of, quote, people of esteem and status. And this is from Carol Meyer's Rediscovering Eve, Ancient Israelite Women in Context. This word can be used, it's used of women who are of great esteem and status. She is a woman who is honored in her society. She's highly respected. She's highly uh, honored in her community. So one of the things that we know is that this woman is highlighted, highlighted and made to stand out on her own at the very beginning of this narrative. She's highlighted, she's, we don't know her name, but we are told she is a great woman and she stands out, she's highlighted. She's not connected to a particular, the name of a husband. Uh, again, we know her husband, she mentions her husband, but uh, the text itself does not tell us what his name is or associate her by saying she is the wife of so-and-so. She is the one that stands out. So this is interesting that she is highlighted and made to stand out and we are told that she is a woman of great esteem, great honor, respect, and status. Another notable feature is that she is the one in this story extending hospitality to Elijah, and it is not her husband. It goes on to tell when we read, it goes on to say it when we read in verse eight. Now it happened one day that Elijah went to Shunem, where there was a notable woman, and she persuaded him to eat some food. The word persuaded here also means to lay hold of him. It's like she grabbed and said, Hey, no, 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 you're going to come and stay with us. So she persuaded him. She, she, for lack of a better way, put him work to him. Like, no, we want you to come stay with us. Now, why is this interesting? Well, normally in the ancient Near East, it is the 
husband in these stories and in ancient Near Eastern customs, uh, custom, it is the husband who offers the hospitality. We see this, Abraham did this in um, uh, Genesis chapter 18, when there are the three travelers coming and it's the Lord. And, but Abraham sees them. He, when he sees them, he gets up, he runs to them. He, bring, he brings them to the tent. Normally in ancient Near Eastern custom, it is the man often who is offering as a rule, offering the hospitality to uh, travelers. Here though, it is not her husband who's offering the hospitality. It is not the husband who's taking the initiative. When you read the story of Abraham, he sees them, he runs to them, he takes the initiative. The one taking the initiative here is the woman. And that's kind of out of the norm of the custom of the day. So it is she who, um, who takes the initiative. So this great woman of esteem is the one who takes initiative to offer Abraham, uh, not Abraham, to offer Elijah hospitality. She feeds him. This means that she is offering her, him food from her store of food. And what is interesting here, again, that the husband is not brought into this. We do not see her, it does not say she, she persuaded him to come in. She went to her husband and said, we have a guest here, prepare food. Or we went to her, to her husband and said, hey, you need to go talk to this guy. And you know, is this okay? She persuades him to come in. She offers him food. She does this. So we see her taking the initiative. We see her being autonomous. We see her uh, acting independent of her husband, because he's not brought into the story until a little bit later. But she is the one who is doing this. Again, in terms of the ancient Near East, this is, this is somewhat out of character in terms of the custom of the day. She doesn't go to her husband. She doesn't check with him. She doesn't check with him about feeding him. She is the one who offers the hospitality. And the husband, where that is concerned, is not even mentioned. Okay? So she feeds him. And again, all, and in all that she's doing, she's acting with authority. She's acting with autonomy. Uh, and apparently in doing this, because her husband had to know, she gets no resistance and she doesn't get any rebuke from her husband. You know, he doesn't say to her, woman, don't you know that I'm the head of this household? And don't you know that I should be the one leading? And don't you, should you not have waited upon me or check with me to bring this stranger into our household? She, he doesn't do that. We see no rebuke. We see no resistance from the husband as the wife is acting to extend hospitality, something normally the male of the household would do, but she is acting with authority. She's acting independently. She's acting with autonomy. All right, and, but, and we see no resistance to this. Again, we also see that it is the woman who takes the initiative in this story to reconfigure her living space. What do I mean? When we read the story, we look at, and it says this, um, and this point she does bring in her husband. Uh, she persuades Elijah to eat some food. So it was that he, as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. So this was a regular thing that she established. She, in essence, became his patron. She became his benefactor. She, when you offer in the ancient world, when you would offer your home and food to a person, that person became your patron. That person became your benefactor. You would come under their protection. So in bringing her, bringing Elijah into her home, she is acting as his patron, benefactor, one who is supplying his needs. So he comes under the protection of her home. By the way, we see this, uh, you can see this in the story of Lot. Remember the story of Lot? Remember when the angels that had been with, um, they were sent from the Lord, uh, uh, when, when we have the story in Genesis 18, they go to Sodom and Gomorrah, they go to Lot, Lot brings them into the, to the home. So who is the one who offers them hospitality? It is the man, he brings them into the home. And then the men come, the men of the city say, come, let us know these men, they're going to do something horrible, uh, more than likely, something sexual with these men. And what Lot does, now it seems, seems strange and, and not something that I would do, but he says, no, 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 these men come, they're, they're in my home, they're under my protection, take my two daughters. But what he's doing, and, and I think that's horrible, by the way, I would never offer my two daughters, but what he's doing is fulfilling the ancient Near Eastern custom of if a stranger comes to your home, they be, you become their patron, you become their benefactor, they come under your protection. You must do whatever is necessary to protect them. This is in, a, in essence what happens, except the one who is being the benefactor, the one who is being the patron is the one who offered the hospitality. And that is the Shunanite notable woman, the Shunammite woman. She is the patron, the benefactor, the protector because she's the one who welcomed in, him into the home. She is the protector of Elijah while he is in 
her home. But what she also does is she reconfigures the living space. So what we see here in verse eight, she says to her husband, look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please let us make a small upper room on the wall and let us put a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand. So it will be whenever he comes to us. So it will be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. So here we do see now she's bringing in her husband. And what does she ask him to do? She says, let's make a space for him. She's reconfiguring her living space so that there can be a quarters be made for Elijah. She does say to her husband, she goes to him, hey, and she says, please, or let or she, um, so one translation says, I pray thee, which can mean, you know, hey, please, this is something I want to do. Let's do this for him. Okay. Evidently, he's in agreement. He does this. Well, here's the thing again that is interesting. Who is the one who makes the initiative, who takes the initiative? Who is the one who offers the idea to reconfigure the living space so that there is a place for Elijah? So now he has a permanent place to stay, or he has he, he knows for sure he has a place to stay whenever he comes to town, because evidently he does this regularly. Who is the one who takes the initiative? It's not the husband. He doesn't offer this. He's not, quote, leading the way where this is concerned. The person who leads the way, who takes the initiative, is the Shunammite woman. She is the one who is leading the way, makes the initiative to reconfigure her living space so that, so that there are some living quarters for the prophet Elijah when he comes to town. That's, that's not putting her husband down. It's just simply stating the fact that, again, we don't see that we don't see her husband saying, hey, you know, Elijah is coming in here regularly. We need to make a place for him. It's not the, the, the husband of the woman that's doing this. It is the husband. And in many ways, as you're looking at this, and by the way, as you read the story of this woman, you kind of get some ideas to why she is a person who is seen as a, she is, a, well, I should say, she is, she is a notable woman. She is esteemed. She is honored by her community because this is a woman who takes action. And this is a woman who, who, um, uh, it really acts in an autonomous, autonomous manner with authority. She, she seems to be pretty self-assured of herself, okay? And I mean, in a positive way, she is self-assured, she is confident, and she takes action, all right? So this is a woman who does take action. Uh, another point of interest, I mean, excuse me, she's the one who takes initiative for the project to make sure that uh, Elijah has a place to stay. She's the one who comes up with the idea. She is the one who pursues the idea to make sure that it gets done. She goes to her husband, yes but she is the one who initiates the idea, okay? So um, the next thing I wanna look at here is another point of interest is 2 Kings chapter eight and verse one and verse two. 2 Kings chapter one, verse eight. I want you to go over there. Again, we're looking at the story of the Shunam Shunammite woman and in chapter eight, and we're gonna be looking at, uh, yeah, chapter eight and then verse one and two. It says uh, in verse one, it says, then Elijah spoke to the woman whose son he had restored to life saying, arise and go you and your household and stay wherever you can for the Lord has called for a famine and furthermore, it will come upon the land for seven years. So the woman arose and did according to the saying of the man of God. And she went with her household and dwelt in the land of the Philistines seven years. I'm gonna read the rest of this. It came to pass at the end of seven years that the woman returned from the land of the Philistines and she went to make an appeal to the king for her house and for her land. Then the king talked with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God saying, tell me please all the great things Elijah has done. Now it happened as he was telling the king how he had restored the dead to life, that there was the woman whose son he had restored to life appealing to the king that there was there the woman whose son he had restored to life appealing to the king for her house and for her land. And Gehazi said, my Lord, O king, this is the woman and this is her son whom Elijah restored to life. And when the king asked the woman, she told him. So the king appointed a certain officer for her saying, restore all that was hers and all the proceeds of the field from the day that she left the land until now. Now, again, here is some points of interest and features in this story. Number one, Elijah goes to her and tell her that a famine is coming. Now, she's been a patron. She's been a blessing to him. He returns and reciprocates the blessing to her. He's already blessed her before. Before, you know, she was childless. Um, if you go back, you go to chapter four, she's been blessing him. He says, what can I do for you? And uh, she says, nothing. If you go back and read, we'll go back and read in a few seconds. But she basically kind of went, or a few minutes, she kind of went, nothing. I'm good. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I'm paraphrasing there, but she's like, I'm good. And, and he says, well, and Gehazi I said, well, you know, she doesn't have any children. She, her husband is old and she's childless. So he prophesies that she's going to have a child and she does have a child. We also know if you follow the story that the child gets sick, something happens, he gets a headache, he dies. She goes to get Elijah. Elijah is going to send Gehazi. She says, nope, I'm not going to leave unless you go with me. Elijah goes with her. Gehazi goes in, lays his staff, Elijah's staff on the child. Nothing happened. Elijah goes in, uh, lays on the child, breathes into his mouth. The child sits up, sneezes seven times. I don't know the significance of that, but he sneezes seven times. And then he comes back to life and he restores the son back to the mother. Okay. So she has had this relationship with uh, Elijah. Okay. She's had this relationship with him. And so he goes and he tells her, hey, this is, there's this famine that's coming. So he tells her to move herself. And this is what's interesting. He says, you and your household, arise you and your household and go and stay wherever you can. She, he tells her, you are to rise up and take, you are to move and your household, your household. Now, what it appears is that her husband has died at this point. We do know he was old at the beginning of the narrative. He was also, because of the fact he's addressing her. Now, it could be that he's alive. It could be. If he is alive, it makes it very interesting that he goes to her and not to him. And he refers to it as her household. Okay. I find that interesting. Most, what I've read thus far from the, the, the scholars that I've read, they speculate he, her husband is probably dead at this point, okay? But I'm saying if somebody wants to argue, no, he was alive, then that's even more interesting that is to her that Elijah goes. But it appears her husband is dead, so Elijah sees her as the head of the household. And it's not another man who is the head of the household. And potentially, the we don't know how, how long this is at this point. In other words, how far along we, we're, we are in the story. Um, it's been a few years, but we don't know how many years it has been, but potentially her son would be the head of the household because if the father is dead, then the son becomes the head of the estate. He would be the head of the household. And yet Elijah says here, I want you to arise and your household. And then the story, and he, he said that the, the woman arose and did according to, to the saying of the man of God, and she went with her household and dwelt in the land of the Philistines seven years. Um, so we know that this is, it's constantly referred to as her household. She is being seen as, uh, for some reason, my alarm is going off in here. Not sure why that's happening. It could be that the batteries are down. Hang on for just one second, folks. I have to take a moment to see what's going on here. <laughs> Okay, they just stopped. Never mind. <laughs> that was weird. All right. Just had to check real quick. And I thought, don't smell smoke. Anyway, going back to our story here, that was a nice little interruption. Going back to our story here, the thing that we see is that, again, it is the woman who is being portrayed as the head of the household. Okay. If the husband is alive, it's, it's interesting that he is not being the one addressed. That would even be more interesting. Elijah goes to the woman, it's, he has had a relationship with her. But he tells her, Kate, you are to arise with your household. And the scripture says she arises and goes with her household. So she is being portrayed as the head of the household. There's not another man. Could be her son potentially is the head of the household. But he is not even presented. The son, who's at least seven years old, he might be older. Maybe at this point, he's 18. Uh, or let's, let's say he was, you know, he was at one point old enough to work with the father in the field. So he's anywhere between... I would say maybe 15 to 18 years of age, he might be older, okay? Um, but, or let's say between 15 and 20 years of age, he would be the head of the household because he would be the heir of the father. But consistently, she is referred, it is referred to you and your household. So what does this mean? Well, Tika Freimer Kinski, who we have been reading from her book, uh, Reading the Women of the Bible, she argues in her book that the land itself, the household itself, belong to the woman and not to her husband. And this may explain why the woman is acting with such authority and autonomy. Let me read to you from her book, Reading the Women of the Bible, page 71. This is from the book here. And let me read to you what she has to say about uh, the woman here, the, the Shunammite woman. Okay, 
Um, eh, where am I at here? Now, and, and what she talks about is when the Shunam, the Shunammite woman comes to the king to plan to to plead for her house. Remember, we read that that after seven years she returned from the land and she went to make an appeal to the king for her house and for her land. Notice it's her house and her land, and the uh, because someone else had moved in there, the king. Uh, so she's making an appeal, uh, and then the king restores to her her house and the land and the proceeds of the land that that came from the field from the day that she had left until now. So he's restoring everything, even the profit from the land. She is to get that also. She's making an appeal for it, though. And so it goes on. She's uh, uh, Tika uh, Freimer Kinski says on page 71 of the book, let me read, the Shunammite herself comes to petition. Her husband is not there and may be dead. She comes to cry for her house and her field. And the king instructs, return to her all that is hers. But is the land hers? And by the king, the way the king says, restore all that was hers. Is the land hers? By Israelite law, as far as we know, a woman does not inherit the property. It becomes her son's, and her son has the obligation to let her stay on it. So why does the story say her land, her field, all that is hers? In a comparable situation, when Naomi wants to regain possession of and sell, and sell the field, she and, and Eli Melech left when they too departed Israel to escape from famine, the field is carefully specified, this is in the story of Ruth, as the portion of field that belonged to our brother Eli Melech. This is in Ruth 4.3. And the property is called all that was Eli Melech's, Ruth 4.9. Surely this Shumanite's land is her husband's if he's still alive, or her sons if he is not. So what she's saying is according to Israelite law, this land should have belonged to her husband. And if he's dead, if he's alive, the land is his. If he's dead, it's her sons. Why does it keep referring to her as, as her land, her house? Okay, the Shunammite woman's story has four unusual elements that may, be inter, that, all, that may all be interrelated. The land is hers. She expresses no need for a child and is markedly independent of her husband. Let me back up and explain that. Again, when Elijah in chapter four says, what can I do for you? She says, nothing. She doesn't even say, I am childless and my husband is old. Can you give me a child? This woman doesn't express a need for a child. And you would think within the context of the day, she would be saying, I'm childless. Uh, you know, if, if I, when, once I'm gone, it's over and my husband has no one to carry on his name or for us to pass the inheritance to. She doesn't even ask for a child, Okay. Uh, why? Don't know. She, she doesn't express, this is what she means by she doesn't express a need for, cho for a child. And, and so, so she said she expressed no need for a child and is markedly independent of her husband. Again, we see this when she brings Elijah in. She offers him hospitality. She gives him food. None of this she consults or checks with her husband. Um, and then she's willing to, while well, she does consult with her husband about uh, the living space for Elijah, she is the one who initiates the idea and she is the one who seeks to reconfigure the space. Uh, so there, so she expresses no need for a child. She is markedly independent of her husband. These three great abnormalities may all relate to the answer the Shunammite gave when Elijah first asked if he could do something for her. And she said, I live among my own people. This is in 2 Kings chapter 4. She says, I live, this is important, I live among my own people. Most women marry outside their kin and go live with their husband's family. The only women required to marry within their own tribe are the daughters of Zelophehad. Uh, uh, as the book of Numbers relates, the daughters, the five daughters of, Zelo, uh, of, of Zelophehad approached Moses toward the end of the period in the desert, and they asked for a change in Israelite inheritance law. Only sons could inherit the land, but there were five daughters, and there was no son. They petitioned that since their father did not deserve to have his lineage and his name completely die, they should be allowed to inherit his property and perpetuate his name. Upon consultation with God, Moses issued the provision that whatever a man that whenever a man died without sons, his daughters could inherit. Uh, they can inherit the land. So that's Numbers 27 verses 1 through 11. So that's in the law of Moses. Later, upon petition by the tribal heir, later, upon petition by the tribal heirs not to allow tribal lands to be lost, Moses issued a further decree that the daughters of, Zelophe, of Zelophehad must marry only within their father's tribe. 
Numbers chapter 36, verse 1 through 12. From then on, a woman who had no brothers owned her land for her lifetime and married within her father's extended family. So this is the law of Moses. This would have been enforced during this time period. Uh, like a latter-day daughter of Zelophehad, Zelophehad, the Shunammite lives among her own kin. And her, law, her land belongs to her. So based off of what the law of Moses says, it appears that this woman is the, the, uh, living among her own kin and the land belonged to her. She might very well be an example of a daughter of Zelophehad, uh, uh, owning her own land, she is not as dependent on men for her livelihood. She can brush off her husband when she has no time for him, uh, knowing that she would still have her property if he divorced her. Now, the reason she says that, I would have to go back and read more of this, but in the story, in chapter four, when the son is with the father in the field, the son begins to get a headache, and the father tells the servants, take him to his mother, and he dies. The mother says, I got to go get Elijah. She goes to her husband. She says, I'm going to go see the prophet. He says to her, why? It's not a festival. It's not a, a, a specific time or a special time. Why are you going to see him? It's almost like he's asking, is something wrong? And she just goes, all is well. She doesn't tell him that the son has died. She doesn't tell him what's going on. She just said, I'm going to go. And I, I have to say this. She didn't ask him for permission to go. She says, I'm going. <laughs> okay. I mean, let me go back. Let's go over to 2 Kings chapter 4. Uh, verse, uh, let's see here, verse, uh, yeah, so uh, it says, this is verse 18, and the child grew. Now it happened one day that he went out to his fathers, to the reapers, and he said to his father, my head, my head. So he said to a servant, carry him to his mother. When he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid on the bed of the, and she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God. What I do find interesting is that this is his only son, and he has the servant take the son, his only son, to the mother. He doesn't accompany. I, I just find that interesting. I don't know if that means anything, if that says anything, if that speaks to anything, but this is his only son, and, he, and you know, maybe he just thinks, oh, he's hurting, but he doesn't break off what he's doing in the field. He just sends the son with the servant. So uh, he, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God in the quarters that she had made for Elijah, shut the door upon him and went out. And then she called her husband and said, please send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and come back. He said, why are you going to him today? It is neither the new moon or, nor the Sabbath. There's no special reason for you to be going. She said, it is well. Uh, and then she goes on to say, it, you know, it is well. Uh, let me turn it. Turn it. Yeah, come on, come on, come on, come on. Okay. And uh, then she sat on the donkey and said to her servants, drive and go forward. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. And so she departed and went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. Again, this woman is taking uh, initiative. She's acting on her own authority. While she says, hey, please send me, you know, she's courteous about it. She does not say, is it okay with you if I go see Elijah? And he questioned, he goes, why, why are you doing this? She goes, I'm going. Now, maybe he sounded concerned. She sounded concerned. And he thought, I'm gonna let her do what she needs to do. I don't know. My point here is that you don't see her as saying like, is it okay, you know, I need to go see Elijah. Is it okay with you that I go? When he says to her, why are you going? She does not give him an answer. She just says, well, she gives him an answer, but she just says, it is well. In other words, she's not acting as some sort of submissive wife who has to tell her husband everything and that she can't act unless she has her husband's permission. That's not how she's functioning here. She still is functioning as an autonomous being, meaning that she is self-governing, she's making her own decisions, she's really acting independent, okay? Uh, it says, so it was when the man of God saw her far off that he took to his, he, he said to his servant Gehazi, look, the Shunammite woman, please run now to meet her and say to her, it is, is it well with you? Is it, is it well with your husband? Is it well with your child? And she kept saying, it is well. Now she fell to his feet. If you read the rest of the story, she basically lets him know what, what has happened. And then the child is healed. So this is what uh, Tikva Primer Kinski meant when she says um, that because the, she, she inherited the land, uh, what did she say again? She said she can brush off her husband when she has no time for him, which is basically, it's kind of what she did. She kind of brushed him off, says, you know, like he goes, well, where are you going? It's well. And she just moves on. And 
the implication here that she that he is drawing that 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 uh, Tikva is drawing is that this could have gotten her in trouble because she just brushes it off. She doesn't tell him anything. Her point is she may not be concerned because this is her land. Uh, and so she knows that even if he divorces her, the property is still hers. And so she she acts, she acts with some confidence. She will, and she said, and she will not have to rely on a son to allow her to live on her husband's land when she is widowed and support from her husband's patrimony. This may explain why the woman of Shunem, along with other barren women in the Bible, did not actively seek a child. So it could be, this is her argument, the reason she was not seeking a child because she had her own money, she had her own land, she had her own uh, wealth, provision to take care of herself. She was not dependent upon anyone, okay? She had a household that we see that she's managing. This, the, and what we see is that there are servants there. So she is in charge of all of this, okay? Um, so she says her ownership of the land gives her independence from her husband, whose permission she need not ask either to be Eliza's patron or to seek his aid. And that is true. She does not get his permission to be a patron or a benefactor to Elijah. Again, when we, Elijah appears on the scene at the beginning of chapter four, verse eight, she just brings him in. She doesn't seek the permission of her husband. She, and then when she wants to build a place for him, she goes to her husband and says, hey, let's do this for him. And she seeks him out to do it, but she's the one who initiates the idea. She's the one who's offering the hospitality. So this is a woman who's really independent. When her child is sick and dies, she takes action to remedy this situation. And I can tell you, you know, being raised by my mom, my grandmother, my aunt, I've seen this. I saw this with both my grandmother on my dad's side, my aunts on my dad's side. These were women. If something where their child was concerned, you better get out of the way. Okay. Well, when it came to the children or the grandchildren, get out of the way. Or their nieces and nephews, get out of the way. These women were going to take action and no one was going to stand in their way. So I grew up with that. I grew up seeing that. And it seems like uh, that that where the Shunammite, Shunammite woman is concerned is the same thing. She is a woman of strength. She is a woman of authority. She is a woman of autonomy. She is not afraid to take action. She seems to be an independent woman who is self-assured and who can take action. Okay, so Tika Frymi Kinski argues that the fact that it's called her land and her actions may speak to the fact that this is actually her land, that the household is her household. Now, to be fair, uh, Carol Myers offers another point of view and actually counters what Tika Primer Kinski says. This is from the book Rediscover, uh, no, I'm sorry, the book Rediscovering Eve. Um, she says this in the book, this is on page 190. So I just want to give you the information to give you both point of views. She says, quote, uh, she talks about the autonomy of the woman, she, and she acknowledges this woman has a lot of autonomy. She's acting independently. She's acting with authority. But she says, does this autonomy and standing and her standing in the community, she's a notable woman, mean that the household is her property? And she references Tika Fremi Kinski's work. She said, not necessarily. As the competent COO or chief operating officer of the household, she manages its affairs looking after his property. The designation mother's household, and she talks about this in chapter six of the book, she said that designation would surely apply to the Shunammite. When an Israelite woman entered a man's household as his wife, she identified with that household and it became hers as well as his. The household is viewed as corporate property given the collective identity of Israelite household. So, and so in chapter six of the book, she talks about that, that when a woman enters into a man's household, that when she leaves her mother and father, enters into that husband's household, that becomes her household as well. And there are times that uh, in, in the uh, scripture that speaks of not only the Beth of, the household of the father, there are scriptures that speaks of the, uh, of the Bet, uh, I think it's Bet Ima, which is the, or the Bet Im, uh, Bet Ima, I forget which the term is, but it's the household of the mother, okay? The household of the mother. Let me see, actually, uh, let's see. Hang on for just for a moment. Let's see if, if she's, what she says here about that. Uh, no, that's about collective identity. Okay, but anyway, uh, there is times when it, the, the text does speak 
of the uh, household as not just the household of the father. The biblical text talks about the household of the mother, the bet, I think it's bet ima, the household of the mother or the bet im, the household of the mother. I think it's im or ima, I don't remember what the exact term is. But either way, it talks about the fact that there are uh, women who, uh, that, the, that the household is referred to as theirs. Let me see, it's bothering me because I wanna make sure I'm, I'm giving it to you correctly. And I'm not seeing it here. Not seeing here. Okay, so I'm not going to worry about it right now. But there, but the the it it translates into English as the household of the woman. So the idea here is that the household could be referred to as the household of the father or the household of the mother. When the when a woman enters into the man's uh, home that he is prepared for her, it is both their homes. Let me read to you again what Carol Myers said where that is concerned. She said, "Quote." Uh, when an Israelite woman enters a man's household as his wife, she identified with that household and it became hers as well as his. The household is viewed as a corporate property or as corporate property given the collective identity of Israelite's household. So this would be seen as her house too. So when it says your household, it does not necessarily mean that she owned land apart from her husband. It could have been the, 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 the household that they held together that they owned together, it, was, it would be seen as hers as well as his. Though there is, given the argument that Tikva Primer Kinski makes, it is plausible also that she owned her own land. I present both of you. The idea is here's whether the idea is this, whether you see it as she owned her own land apart from her husband, this was her own land or it was the land that she owned with her husband and she was the manager of it, which is the way it would have been. We're gonna talk about that more in just a moment. Either way, she is the one in charge of the household. She is the one, the manager of the household. She is the one leading the household, which is why it is said, it is her household. She's in authority over the household, meaning she's in authority even where her son is concerned and over all of the servants of the household. Okay. So wanted to bring that out. That's another notable feature of this story. She is a woman of authority and independence. Um, here's the thing also to notice, and I was thinking about this this morning, and I quickly put it in my notes. I had to revise my notes. When she goes before the king, because she, Elijah tells her, go away, there's going to be a, a famine for seven years, and so go live somewhere else. This lets us know that evidently this woman is wealthy enough that she's able to go and live somewhere else for seven years. She has enough means that she could take care of her, herself and her household in a famine for seven years. So this woman is doing pretty well for herself. Also, here's the thing that is interesting. When she goes before the king, she goes on her own. What do I mean? She does not appeal to anyone else. She doesn't appeal to her son to go as a mediator. She doesn't appeal to Elijah to go and speak to the king on her behalf to get what was hers. Now, why do I say that? Because um, he once extended that to her. Go back to 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. And if you look at verse uh, 12. He says to her, then this is after the woman has shown him kindness. She's been his patron. She's been taking care of him. She made a home for him. She's feeding him whenever he comes to town. He says in verse 12, then he said to, Ge to Gehazi, his servant, call the Shunammite woman, uh, call the Shunammite, the Shunammite woman. When he called her, she stood before him. And he said to him, and she, and he said to him, say to her, look, you have now been concerned for us with this care. What can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or to the, or to the commander of the army? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. Now that really does, number one, she says, I dwell among my own people. It's like, I don't need, I don't need anyone else's help. This woman seems to possess a, a sense of self-assuredness and that I can take care of myself. I don't know any other way to explain that. She says, I dwell among my own people. No, I don't need the help of a general. I don't need the help of a king. I have all that I need. But notice that Elijah offers to, um, to speak on her behalf to the king. She turns it down. Now, years later, 
when her when she after you know when she returns from the famine she goes back to her land and to her home and there have been other people who have taken it over they have planted on it and they have reaped from it so they're using her house they're using her land without her permission it's like you know squatters and she goes to the king now gehazi happens to be there and he's telling the story of what Elijah's been doing, the miracles that he's done. And he goes, oh, look, here's that woman. Remember I was telling you the story about the woman who got her son raised? That's her right there. And the king restores all that belonged to the woman. And not only does he restore um, all that restores, all, he, not only does he restore all that belongs to her, he also, he also, he, he, not often, he all, also states that all of the, let me go, let me get exactly what he said here. He said, the king appointed a certain office for her saying, restore all that was her, her land and her home, and all the proceeds of the field from the day she left until now. So all of that produce, all of the profit, all of the fruit that was gained, he said, everything that, that the proceeds of it, that needs to be returned back to her from the day she left until now. So he made her even more wealthy. But here's the thing, even though Gehazi is there, I think providentially, this woman shows up on her own. She didn't go to Elijah and ask for help. She did not ask for anyone or another man to stand as her mediator. She is the one who takes the initiative. Once again, we see this woman operating with authority. We see her operating with autonomy. We see her operating with confidence. We see her operating with self-initiative. She is the one who goes. She doesn't depend upon anyone else. She could have went to Elijah and said, hey, remember once long ago, you asked me if I could speak for the king on your behalf. I need you to do that now. No, she shows up and she expects to get results. And God providentially is moving on her behalf. Gehazi is already there. He says, this is the woman that, who I was telling you about when her son was raised from the dead. And it also speaks to the fact that, that you know, it, um, that the king favors the stories about Elijah. And so he probably sees her as being somehow in a special, uh, uh, in a special relationship, not a platonic relationship with uh, Elijah, that there's God's favor upon her. I'll put it like that. And so he restores everything to her. This woman, this Shunammite woman, if you look at it, just read the story, you go like, oh, this is the woman who um, Elijah helped her to, you know, he, she took care of Elijah and she had a son, son died, Elijah raised her from the dead. There are elements within the story that speaks to the authority, the autonomy, the, the self-initiating acts of this woman. She is not someone who's waiting upon other people. When it comes to her son's death, Boom, she takes action, doesn't even get her husband involved other than to say, I need you to send me someone uh, with a donkey and I guess maybe a cart so to, to take me to where Elijah is. Uh, but she is taking the initiative. She is a woman who's consistently acting and we see that she is managing, managing the household uh, as Carol Meyer calls her, the COO, the chief operating officer. Either this is her household that she owns jointly with her husband, or it is her own household. But either way, she is the one that's in charge. She is the one that's in charge. All of that is within that story when we look at it closely. Okay? So, uh, again, she takes authority. She's a woman of authority. She's a woman of independence. Uh, she acts with and on her own initiative. Another woman that we see acting with authority. So let me say, this goes again contrary to what I call the patriarchal principle. This goes contrary to the patriarchal principle. This woman is acting with authority, okay? She is not waiting. She's not getting permission from her husband to do certain things. She's acting. She's not waiting to be led by her husband. She's taking the initiative. Okay, and she's not being rebellious. The Bible, remember, she's a notable woman. The Bible is not speaking of her in a negative manner. It speaks of her in a very positive manner. Now, another woman that we see acting with authority, with autonomy, with initiative, is the Proverbs 31 woman. There's a guy by the name of Gilbert uh, Bilazikian. He wrote a book called Beyond Sex Roles. I mentioned this last week. Here's the book here. Wrote it years ago. Um, and uh, in this book, he sees the passages in Proverbs 31. Let me get a sip of water here. He sees the passages uh, in regards to this woman. Um, and he, well, I should say, 
he sees this passage and the passage concerning the Proverbs 30 woman as, quote, accomplishing a verse by verse demolition of the male dominated hierarchical structure that issued from the fall by showing God's idea for women to share fully in the responsibilities of governing community life in the family and beyond. So he sees the Proverbs 31 passages. He sees the woman in the passages as really demolishing, deconstructing the male dominated hierarchical structure that would happen as the result of the fall. Now, I do believe that patriarchal structures did issue, they, they were a result of the fall because it's in Genesis chapter three, verse 16, where God says to the woman that he shall rule over you. That had never been said before. This is the first time we see this, okay? We never see God tell the man in Genesis that he is to lead the woman or rule over her. I know there are complementarians, as I said before, who say, well, in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, God establishes the rule of the man over the woman. But we never see the man being told that he is to rule over the woman. The only rule that is spoken to the man is also spoken to the woman in Genesis chapter 1, where God says, uh, let us create them in our image and likeness. He creates man and woman in his image and likeness. And then he says, have dominion to both of them. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowls of the air, over the earth, and over every creeping thing. The only time they are told to rule over something is over other animals and over the world. They are never told, or over the earth, they're never told to rule each other. The man is not told to rule the woman. Even in Genesis 2, when God creates the woman, from the man's side, he says, this is not bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. You shall be called Isha because you came from the East. You should be called woman because you came from the man. But nowhere is that is it said, and, and, or does God say, and by the way, you're to rule over her. You know, in case you're wondering who's in charge, Adam, you are. He doesn't do that. Okay. They are to rule together over the earth. They are given dominion, but it is not over each other. Okay. So I said all that to say that what Gilbert uh, uh, Bilezakian uh, is saying, it's a really interesting name, folks. I have to make sure I'm saying it right. What he's saying again is that Proverbs 31 basically demolishes the male. And what do you mean by demolishes is it kind of does away with this idea um, that, hey, this is supposed to be a male dominated hierarchical structure that women are to function in. Um, and, and, and he said, this comes from the fall, because what we see in Proverbs 31 is God's idea. Women sharing fully in the responsibilities of governing community life in the family and beyond. So he sees the woman as making independent decisions that her husband respects. He sees verse 11 and 12 as speaking to the fact that she's making independent decisions that her husband respects. He sees her as, as a provider of food for the family, verse 31 I'm um, excuse me, chapter 31 and verse 15, he sees her as providing, he, he calls her the provider of food for the family. He sees her as possessing an independent career. He refers to her as a working wife because she combines a career and housekeeping. And he sees her as, quote, the vigilant supervisor of the family, the one responsible for making managerial decisions affecting the life of her household. And again, this is from the book Beyond Sex Roles, page 58 of the book. So he sees her as being a person of authority, being independent in her decision making, being self initiating, being a career woman, and being autonomous. This is how he sees the Proverbs 31 woman. Now, let me say too that the Proverbs 31 woman, many scholars actually just see this as another praise to wisdom itself, that it is wisdom personified um, as a woman. But what we do know is that many of these duties that we see taking place, these were things that women did do. So whether you see this as portraying the ideal woman or whether you see this as really speaking to wisdom and that the things that wisdom will enable you to do, which is a nice translation also, uh, but it is, it, is, it is embodied, even if you see it as wisdom, it is embodied within a woman fulfilling and doing a lot of the duties that women in ancient Israel would do. And it is speaking of these things as a praise of these women and the activities that they engage in, okay? It's spoken of as a praise. It's not just seen as, oh, well, they just keep house. Oh, they just sweep the floor and cook. And No, this is seen as a praise. And, and keep in mind that, that uh, the woman here is highly praised by her husband and by her children. 
Now, as I said before, Gilbert Belizikian, uh, Belizikian, I hope I'm pronouncing the name, uh, Belize, or is it, it's either Belizikian or Belizikian. I'll say Belizikian, we'll stick with that, it's easier to say. <laughs> what he sees, uh, and the reason I bring him up is because Wayne Grudem, this is why I'm bringing up this particular person, uh, and this guy had some problems later on, was actually accused of sexual harassing women. Um, but the re So the reason I'm bringing him up is because Wayne Grudem, I'm bringing him up because of the arguments he made, and then Wayne Grudem argues against his arguments. Uh, he, he, he argues against what is said in the book. So let me read to you. Um, and he, again, he's arguing from a complementary perspective, Dr. Wayne Grudem, in his book, Evangelical Feminism and Biblical Truth. Uh, he has a problem with how Belize Kean is reading and interpreting Proverbs 31. Uh, let me read to you from page 156. And he offers some pushback on some of the things that were be said. And I think, to be fair, we need to read his pushback and look at it and examine it. Okay, so he says in page, on page 156, he says, um, Belize Kean often inserts into the biblical text things that are not there. We see this by quoting Belize Kean's argument about several verses in Proverbs 31, and then quoting the actual verses themselves. In each case, what Belizekian claims about the verse is not there. Here are some examples. Uh, Belizekian writes uh, in verse 11, uh, he quotes verse 11 and 12, her husband has confidence in her. He respects her judgment and her independent decision. But the verse actually says, according to Grudem, and the verse does say this, the heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. Grudem goes on to say, these verses do not say, I'm excuse me, these verses do say her husband trusts her, but they say nothing about ind independent decisions. Probably he does respect her judgment and her decisions, but to talk of independent decisions is to begin to drive a wedge into the harmony and interaction that God intends between husband and wife. Now, when I read that, I put a side note, I go, how? How does that drive a wedge? And why would you say it drives a wedge? Because when you actually look at the text, so Grudem doesn't agree that she's making independent decisions. He doesn't agree with that. He says, it just says that her husband trusts in him. But if you look at Proverbs chapter 31, you do see the woman making decisions without consulting her husband. So let's go over to, I should have told you to turn it. Let's go over to Proverbs chapter 31, and you'll see that the woman is making decision without her husband. Proverbs chapter 31, he says, it says in verse 16, she considers a field and buys it. From her prophets, she plants a vineyard. She's, she's the one that considering it. It doesn't say she considers a field, checks with her husband about whether or not she should buy the field, Together, they make a decision. He okays it, and then she buys it. It says, she considers a field, she buys it from her profits, she plants a vineyard, okay? So she's making a decision. Verse 20 says, she extends her hand to the poor. Yet, yes, she reaches out her hand to the needy, so she makes a decision to be charitable. Verse 24 says, she makes linen garments and sells them and supplies sashes for, sashes for the merchants. So we see this woman being... Uh, industrious. We see her making business decisions. We see her making a profit because of her decisions. And never once does it say she's consulting with her husband or she seeks out the leadership of her husband for, before she makes her decisions. This would imply that, yes, he does trust her. And two, she's making these decisions independent because to say that, well, she's checking with her husband, then we have to import something in the text. Then we would be doing the very thing that Grudem accuses uh, Belize Kean is of doing. But it shows us here plainly, she's making decisions without checking with her husband. So she is making independent decisions. She buys, she sells, she makes profits. These are activities that she is portrayed as doing on her own. She plants a vineyard. She takes her profit, plants a vineyard. She doesn't check with her husband. She plants a vineyard. She's doing this on her own initiative. We are not told that her husband is directing her or guiding her in these decisions. Grudem also takes issue with her being seen as, quote, the provider in the family rather than the husband. Let me read to you what he says again from Evangelical Feminism and Biblical Truth. This is on page 156. Again, 
And what he says here is, uh, Belizekian writes, he quotes verse 15, she is diligent and competent in the management of resources. Oh, excuse me, she is, Belizean writes, verse 15, she is diligent and competent in the management of resources, personnel and responsibility in her house. She is the provider of food for the household. Now it does say, he does say that in the book, but the verse actually says, she rises while it's night, she provides food for her household and portion for her maidens. The problem with Belize, Belize statement is that calling her the provider of food for the household can easily be understood to mean that she is the primary breadwinner or primary provider of income for the household. This is the impression Belizekian attempts to give because he later says she manages for herself an independent career and, quote, she is a working wife as she combines career and housekeeping, while his view of the husband is anything but positive. See, next verse. Uh, and he says, the verse just means she puts out food for the day. So Belizekian sees her as being competent in the management of resources, personnel, and responsibility, and that she is the provider of food for the household. It says she rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. Rudin is like, no, 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 he's making too much of this because it's putting her in the position that she's the leader of the household by being the provider, and all she does is just sitting out food. Okay. I think Grudem's concern is that Belizekian's word will be taken to me, again, she's the provider, that she's up, that she's usurping the role of the husband or the role of the, role of the man or the husband as the leader and provider. I think that is his concern from a complementarian point of view. However, I think he is overstating the case and his concern about, the, and that his concern is really, well, who's the real boss here? Is it the woman or the man? And I think he's missing the point that Belizekian was reading and it's influenced how, how he is reading Belizekian's words. This is why I say this. Carol Myers has this to say about um, the woman's role as a breadwinner and provider in the home. I'm going to read from this book called The Biblical World of Gender, The Daily Lives of Ancient Women and Men. A wonderful little book. This is on page nine of the book. Highly recommend this. It help you give you some insight into the ancient Israelite world also, and, and, and also in the first century. But this is what Carol Meyer says. She has a chapter in this book. She says, quote, preparing bread was not simply a domestic chore. It was a life-sustaining activity. It was no less important to household survival than was the work of men in growing the grain that provided for the bread. While men and women were not equal in all aspects of community life, they made equally important contribution to household life. Now notice here, she separates out the fact that they were not equal in all aspects of community life, but they made equally important contributions to their household life. Both women and men were breadwinners. In fact, women dominated many household activities and men dominated others. This is called gender complementarity. Now, what she says here is that both the men and the women contributed to the life, to the household, to the sustaining of the household, and that there were areas of the household in terms of activities that women dominated in, and then there were those that men dominated in. She called this gender complementary, complementarity, not gender complementarianism. That's different. She's not, she's not a complementarian believing that men are to lead, men are created to lead, Women are created to submit to and follow that lead and women never lead men. Gender complementarity means that, and, and this is the true meaning of complementarity, that there's a mutuality, that one supports the other with their gifts and their talents. Complementarianism, as it is used by complementarians today, say, yeah, everybody has their role, everybody has their place that they have to play, but there's hierarchy involved. And so one person, i.e. the man, is over another person, the women and the children. Gender complementarity says, hey, we all have gifts, we all have talents, we got to contribute to our lifehood, our livelihood, we got to contribute to the sustaining and the flourishing of our family, and we bring all of our gifts, and we work together, and there are going to be some things that I'm going to be in charge of, and then there are going to be other things that you are in charge of, and there's not necessarily any, comp there's not necessarily any hierarchy there in the sense of I'm over you, you over me. We're going to talk about this more next week in part three of this as we get more into it. 
my point here is that uh, Carol Myers recognizes that women were seen as being part of that uh, were also seen as being breadwinners. It just just wasn't the men. They were providers because part of their activity was to take the food and to convert it in uh, and to take raw materials and convert it in things that the household needed. And this was seen as very important. Um, let me read. So both the men and the women were seen as breadwinners and providers in the home. Okay, I'm gonna talk some more about this in just a second. Grudem also takes issue with uh, Belize Kean's speaking of the Proverb 31 woman as the supervisor and manager of the home. Let me read to you about that. He takes issue with that. This is from page 157. And uh, let me read you paragraph two and three. He says, uh, Belize Kean writes, she is the vigilant supervisor of her household. The total list of her accomplishments indicates that she is the one responsible for making the managerial decisions affecting the life of the home. This is what Belezikian, Belezikian writes. Grudem writes, but the verse actually says, she looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. The verse says she cares for her household and is not idle. But Belezikian's language makes her sound like the head of the household because he refers to her as the vigilant, the vigilant supervisor and the one responsible for making the managerial decisions. The chapter praises the godly conduct of this wife, but it does not make her the head of the household or say anything about usurping her husband's authority. The Lezikians inserts into the biblical text ideas that are not there and thus claim the Bible teaches things that it does not teach. Now, let me say this, I, I had this for later. I'm amazed that Grudem says this because he inserts into Belizekian's words things that Belizekian does not actually say. Belizekian never says she is the head of the household. He says, he calls, he refers to her as the vigilant supervisor, the one responsible for making managerial decisions. It is Grudem who says the language makes her sounds like the head of the household. Grudem inserts that. And he says that uh, that praising the chapter praises the conduct of the wife, but it does not make her the head of the household or say anything about usurping her husband's authority. And Belizekian never says anything because I've read it. Never says anything about her usurping her husband's authority. So Grudem is guilty of what he claims Belizekian of actually doing. He's inserting things into his words that he didn't actually say. This is what we call a straw man argument. Because uh, he's, he's, he's making a point, asserting a point that actually is not there, then he's arguing against that point. The guy never said that she's the head of the household and usurping her, her husband's authority. What he says is, let me, let me read you what he says again. It's in um, the book, uh, this is from um, Grudem's book, and, but he quotes accurately what is actually said by Belezekian. He says, she is the vigilant supervisor of her household. The total list of her accomplishments indicates that she is the one responsible for making the managerial decisions affecting the life of the home. Grudem has a problem with this because he, he takes that as, that means she's the head of the household. Well, not necessarily. Let me read to you again from Carol Myers from the book, The Biblical World of Gender. This is from page nine again, different paragraph. This is what she says about women in the household. She says, uh, let's see, make sure I'm getting the right thing here. Yes. She says, um, okay. She says, further, creating bread and other commodities in traditional societies where it can't be attained in any other way, by going to the store, this was a source of considerable household power. Now, hear that. The ability to create bread, the ability to create other commodities as needed in the home when you can't go down to the wall, to the, to the, to the Walmart, to the local Walmart, get what you needed. This was seen as a source of considerable household power. The people able to create what was needed were seen as holding considerable power. Moreover, in organizing the daily activities surrounding the production of food and other essential commodities, the senior woman in the typical extended family household functioned as a household manager. In today's term, she was the household COO, chief operating officer. So 
Is Beleza Kian incorrect to say she is the household manager? No, this is the same thing Carol Meyer is saying. She is the one who is responsible for the day, daily activities surrounding the production of food and other essential commodities. So she is functioning as a household manager or the chief operating officer of the home. Let me read to you from page 10 of the same book. She goes on to say concerning, um, yeah, where's it at here? Yeah, page 10, she says, let's not forget the strong woman of Proverbs 31, verse 10 through, 10 through 31. These 22 verses portray a household manager. More than half refer to economic processes. She provides food and engages in textile production. She purchases land and has a profitable business. She sells the textiles she produces to merchants. Moreover, she uses some of her household resources as charity for the poor. This woman is a household manager, contra or contrary to what Dr. Grudem says. She is a household manager. This is how she would have been portrayed. Let me, you know, the Bible says in the mouth of two, three witnesses, let every word be established. Let me read to you now from the social world of ancient Israel. By the way, there was another session that I dealt with this when I talked about art where women oppressed in ancient Israel. I, we, we talked about some of these things before. You can go check that out. Uh, this is the social world of ancient Israel by Victor H. Matthews and Don C. Benjamin. This is what they say in regards to the role of women in the household. Let me read to you from page 23 of the book here. They say, quote, uh, let's see, where, 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 sorry. It's a quote, the mother of a household in the Bible had significant power and authority over decision-making and problem-solving for both land and children. And he goes on to say patriarchy in ancient Israel was based, listen to this, Patriarchy in ancient Israel was not based on the subordination and exploitation of women, but rather on the efforts of all the men and women in its household to survive. The father was off authorized to make communal decisions for the household. He oversaw the public use of its land and children. Whenever the households in a village worked together on common projects, it was the father who decided to what extent his own household would participate. So that would be if we were to give it a, an illustration, put it in today. You know, I live in this neighborhood. I live on a street called, um, what street do I live on? Lunt Court. Let's say this is our village here, right? And we're all going, all the, all the houses on the block are going to do a, a joint project together. I, as the father of the household, would decide what is going to be our contribution to the communal project, okay? That, that is what my role would be. That's how I would be functioning. So I would oversee the public use of land and children. Whenever the households in a village worked together on common project, it was the father who decided to what extent his own household would participate. Then he goes on to say, although the power and authority of the mother of the household were distinct from the power and authority of the father of the household, they were not necessarily inferior to his. Hebrew villagers, villagers did not systematically empower every male and subordinate every female. Okay, let me make sure what else do I want to read to you here. Nope, lost my place. Okay. Um, then he goes on to say this. Uh, yeah, he goes on to say this is very. Uh, oh, this is uh, page twenty-five. One important, and it's subtitled, The Mother as Manager. Now, this is from the book, The Social World. This is how they function in the ancient world. He has a, 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 a chapter, a, a, not chapter, a subtitle here, The Mother of the Household as Manager. One important role of the mother that was not gender specific was her responsibility as the manager of the household. Early Israel believed that only in a subsistence economy Excuse me, could it be, could its households really understand Yahweh as Lord, which meant that Yahweh was the sole protector and provider in Israel? Hebrew villages assigned major responsibilities for the creation and maintenance of the substance economy to the mother of the household. Let me read that again for the people in the back. Hebrew villages assigned major responsibilities for the creation and maintenance of the subsistence economy 
to the mother of the household. Therefore, she directed the manufacturer of the soap, pottery, basket, clothes, and tools. But more importantly, she determined how much food was to be concerned, consumed and how, and how much was to be stored as beer, parched grain, and dried vegetables. To assure that everyone in the household was fed and that the food lasted until the next ration was distributed, her authority over the goods and produce assigned to her household by the village was absolute. In the world of ancient Israel, a man's home was his wife's castle. Read that again. In the world of ancient Israel, a man's home was his wife's castle. She had the domestic authority, which he did not. Remember I said before, Carol Mayer said, there were things that the woman uh, had, uh, uh, there were uh, affairs that she dominated, activities that she dominated, that she ruled over, and then there were things that the man ruled over. It was a gender complementarity, meaning they, they worked together. It was a mutual leading and guiding and ruling in the household, all right? Uh, so again, in the world of ancient Israel, a man's home was his wife's castle. She had the domestic authority, which he did not. Now, he goes on and gives a story. This dynamic is clearly seen in the sufferer and the soul from Egypt, a dispute over suicide that dates between 2050 and 1800 BCE. It includes a parable which compares the domestic authority of the mother of a household to the authority of the divine assembly over human life. The sufferer in the dispute wants to commit suicide and in his life of pain and failure. The soul tells him the parable to argue that it is as foolish for him to challenge the authority of the divine assembly over his life as it would be for a father to challenge the authority of a mother of the household over the food that she distributes. The sufferer has no more right to take his life into his own hand than the father has a right to take more food into his hands than the mother of the house rations out to him. Here is the story, let me read it to you. A man ordered his wife to serve all of her food, all of her food at noon. Now remember, she is responsible to make sure that, that they have enough to eat. They have to live off of this. This is the basis, the foundation of life. This is why this is so important. She is the manager. She is the authority over the food. How much is eaten? When it is eaten? What is stored? When do we bring it out and eat it again? She's the one that determines all of this. So a man ordered his wife to serve all of her food at noon, but she refused. This food is for our supper. The man stormed out of the house arguing with himself as he went back to work. Can you imagine this? I oh, don't see, I work all day. I bring in the grain. All she has to do is bring me some food. What is, what, what, who's she going to tell? I'm a man. She's going to tell me that I can't eat the food, but he didn't get that food. <laughs> he did not get that food. So the man stormed out of the house. Notice he did not take the food. He did not force her. He left the house. When the man came home, he was still furious. Why wouldn't he listen to his wife's advice? Why couldn't anyone in his family reason with him? Now, he was angry with her, but what we are not told is that he decided to overrule her authority by saying, I'm the man of this household. You bring me this food or I'll go get it myself. He respects her authority. We could even say he submits to her domestic authority over the household. She is in charge of all of the food stuff. She is in charge of the resources of the home. OK, so again, uh, according to these scholars of the world of ancient Israel, there, there was a shared authority that men and women operated in for the good of the family, for the good of the household. So in terms of the house itself, though, the, though women were the managers and they were the managers. So this is contra to what Dr. Grudem said. But Liz Akian was right. She is the manager. She is the she is managing the household. She's the CEO, as Meyer says. She's the chief operating officer. She possesses uh, domestic authority over the home, as Victor Matthews and D uh, Don Benjamin says. She possesses domestic authority over the home that even the man did not have, and that he, if he wanted to live, that he had to submit to. Okay. This is not about people trying to rule over and subjugate another. And it's not about the women in these stories. It's not about the Shunammite woman or the Proverbs 30 woman, 30 woman rising up saying, you know, uh, I don't care what you say. I'm going to do what I want. 
these are women that are portrayed as wise, but they also are trade, portrayed as, as taking the initiative, making right decisions that end up being a blessing to everyone involved. So Grudem is wrong in not seeing the woman here in Proverbs 31 as a woman of authority and power whose decision-making is, inde is independent of her husband and who is working with her husband to provide for and maintain their household. She is a career woman who is also keeping house because she has a business. And where does she run the business? It's from her house, which is how most of it was done. It's not only the business of producing food for the household, she is buying land. She is making uh, textile. She's making clothing and selling them and getting profit and then investing her profits. This is a wise woman that is being portrayed here who is making decisions on her home, on, on her own. We do not see her. And, I, and I'm not saying that she never went to her husband and said, don't think of it. What I'm saying is what we see in the text is this woman making her own decisions as an entrepreneur, making her own decisions as a businesswoman, uh, investing in her profits, selling to other people. She has customers that seem to be independent of her husband. And she is in charge. She does provide food for the household. As the manager, the CEO of the household, this is what she does. She is in charge of the supervision of making sure that everything is produced for that household. She is producing the clothing. This is what the women of that period did. And it was seen as not only a very important role, but it was seen as a role uh, holding considerable power because it had to do with the very sustaining of life itself. These women, the Shunammite women, the Proverbs 31 women, Abigail, these women are seen as women of authority, women of autonomy, women of self-initiative. They take action and they are women who are wise. They move in the wisdom of God. Okay. So what is stated here in Proverbs 31 by Belize Kian is in keeping with what scholars and researchers of ancient Israelite women and their lives is what they have found and what they have confirmed. What he says about her being a manager, what he says about her being a provider, all of that is in keeping with what we know today based upon the research that has been done. This is how the people live. These are how these women would have been seen. These women, again, I'll, and I'll end with this. They are women of authority. They are women of independence. They are women of wisdom and effective independent decision-making for their lives and for their homes. Now in saying these things about women and saying these things about these wives, we see them operating in these qualities that I just enumerated, not to the detriment of their families, but for the betterment and the flourishing of their families. In every single one of their stories, these women making these decisions, taking these actions, it always results in the flourishing of their life and the life of their families, always. So we, we do not see these qualities driving a wedge between husbands and wives. Rather, we see it causing a flourishing in the household and between the husbands and wives. Matter of fact, let's end with what is said in Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 28. The husband, it says, her children rise up after all these things that she does and calls her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, and beauty, beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Rather than diminishing what these women do and women like her do, I can say I'm married, as I said, to an Abigail. I'm married to a Proverbs 31 woman. I'm married to a woman who makes decisions, who, uh, who uh, uh, is independent, who is an entrepreneur who makes profit, who, pro who also with me provides for the family. We do that together. Does she check with me about every little decision that she needs to make? No. And in fairness, complementarians will say, we don't require for our wives to check with us for every little decision. But it is also said, but when it comes down to a decision that needs to be made, which says that, you know, we got to make some certain decisions. And if there is, a, if we can't decide together, as the husband, this is what complementarians say, as the husband, I hold the trunk, uh, the trunk card. I get to make the last decision. I get to make the final decision. To which I go, why? <laughs> why do you get to make the final decision? In our household, we look at who has the most knowledge and the information. We pray about things together. She'll ask me about something and I'll ask her and she'll go, well, what do you want to do? I might go, well, what do you want to do? 
now and it all depends upon if it's something that I've initiated, I probably will make the last decision on it. If it's something that she's initiated, I say, I trust your judgment and I will go along with whatever you decide to do. Have we always made the best decisions when, it, when we have initiated a project? No, not always. But it didn't never drive a wedge between us because we have a rule. We support one another. We back up one another. Now, have there been times when I wanted to do something and she goes, I don't think that's what you should do. Now she says, now I'll support you, what you whatever you want to do, but I don't think that's what you're supposed to do. I consider her my other wisdom. So uh, my, uh, as the rabbis will call her, her my other self. She's, we're one. She's my other self. So I, that's the way I think. And I go, okay, she's my other wisdom. Let me contemplate. Let me think about Let me reflect on what she says. And Karen does the same thing. So we do listen to one another. But if we decide, if she decides, hey, this is what I, I, I think this is the best decision to make. This is what I'm going to do. I go, okay, I'm behind you. 100%. I get behind her. And does it always work out when we make our own decisions and we, and we go contrary to what the other person says? No, it doesn't always work out. But do we come back and go, see, I told you. No, we do not. Then, we, then it becomes a matter of it creates a problem. Okay, let's work on it together to see how we can solve that problem, right? My point here is that the women here are working together with their husband and they are wise, they are independent, they are effective independent decision makers and they are being praised for that or at least the Proverbs 30 woman, she's being praised for that. The Shunammite woman is praised as a notable woman. She's held up and she is not condemned in any way, form or fashion for the actions. Abigail is not condemned for the actions that she had to take. Like it says here in Proverbs, it says, a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands. Let her own works praise her in the gate. So what we as men should be doing is those women who act with authority, who act with wisdom, who act in the best interest, not only for themselves, but also for their household and for their communities, we shouldn't be trying to diminish their authority. We shouldn't be trying to diminish their decision-making. We should support them and praise them. And that's where I'm gonna close right there. Went a little bit longer today than I intended, but that's what I wanted to get out to you. All right. Hope you enjoyed this. If you did enjoy this, please share this with someone that you believe could benefit from it. I'm going to upload this within the next two hours or so to our uh, YouTube channel, KIC TV, keeping it in context TV. And you can direct people there to watch the video. If you do, and if you are watching this video, we ask you to do two things. Number one, subscribe. Number two, hit the like. That helps to uh, the, uh, the algorithm to say, uh, it, says, it says to the algorithm, hey, this is something that people are enjoying and it's useful. Let's send it out to more people. So subscribe if you haven't. Click the like button if you like this video and leave a comment. You know, and even if it's a comment where you disagree with me, leave a comment and I will do my best to see uh, to try to respond to it. Hope you again, that, hope again that you enjoyed this. Lord willing, we'll be back here next week with part three of this. I believe it will be the final part of this where we're going to talk about how is it that if this is a patriarchal society, how are these women, Deborah, uh, Abigail, the Shunanite woman, the uh, wise woman of Abel Bet Ma'acha, the Proverbs 31 woman, how are these women operating in authority? How are they operating independently with authority of their own if it is a patriarchal society and if it's a world where men are to lead and women are to, uh, and they're to lead women and women are to submit to and follow that lead and not lead men. We see these women doing that. How is that work? And how is it that when it's happening and these women are doing that, no man is resisting and or rebuking them? We're going to talk about that next week. All right. So God bless. Thank you for being here. We'll see you all, Lord willing, next Saturday. Bye-bye.